Good. So, so let's go to another related issue, again, related to the church and related to religion and related to, and that's the issue which is controversial even among, I'm sure, the listeners uh, today and, and among, uh, among uh, a lot of people who are fans of Ayn Rand, which is the issue of abortion. And you wrote, you wrote an article about um, how uh, people use science in order to, or the, the, the opponents of abortion are using science to try to attack um, to attack a woman's right uh, to an abortion. And um, I think that's a, it's, it's a really interesting issue because you see it all the time. You see this issue of science and, and uh, them raising the issue of science constantly uh, with regard to abortion. I think they, you point out three examples of this, but I actually think there's a fourth, which-, which, which Oh, probably, yeah. Yeah, well, the fourth is viability. Which is which is the one they you know that the, the is not so much deals with the first trimester, but because they don't want to argue about the first trimester. I mean, it's much more convenient for the anti-abortionists to argue about the last trimester, even though there are barely any abortions in the last trimester. But the first trimester is more difficult. But but the three, tell us about the three uses of science that to to object to abortion, and then we'll talk about why very relevant to the philosophical, moral, ethical decision or legal decision about abortion. Sure. So uh, the first one is, is, is almost always the first one I hear when I, when I would teach this controversy in, in college is the heartbeat issue. But, but the, the fetus has a heartbeat, and yep. so it's alive. And I mean, to some extent, this is true. At a certain point, you can detect either uh, the actual sound, but even before that, with ultrasound, you can you can detect the uh, the the visual evidence at least of some kind of something that looks like a heartbeat at least. Yep. Whether you should really consider that it uh, biologically a heartbeat is an interesting question. But uh, so that's one point. Second is the issue of uh, fetal pain, and I mean there I think that uh, I I often see uh, commenters from the left. Uh, say that it's a pseudoscientific claim that the fetus experiences pain. And I've now spent a fair amount of time looking at the scientific literature on that. I don't think that's true. I think there's an open question, which I don't think that even the best scientists in the field believe is settled uh, about whether they do or not. Uh, and it's a very complex debate. But the, uh, the argument they make is, well, if they can feel pain, then uh, abortion would cause pain. It'd be awful. Uh, and then the third is just the, the fact that the fetus has human DNA, which we've known for decades and decades, obviously, not 100 years. But um, that's definitely an important scientific discovery. Uh, it was the foundation of modern embryology. But their idea is, well, if it's, a, if it's got human DNA, it must be a human being, and therefore it's wrong to kill it. Those are the three big ones. And the one that I spend, uh, I spend more time talking about the, the pain issue and the DNA issue in the article because the, 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 the heartbeat is a little bit easier to dispense with because, I mean, lots of living creatures have heartbeats. And uh, unless you're a vegetarian, uh, that, that doesn't stop us uh, from having sometimes having reason to, to kill them. And the same issue, uh, really is what's at stake with the fetal pain issue, which is that, I mean, lots of animals besides human beings uh, feel pain too, but unless you're a vegetarian and most um, anti-abortion people aren't, uh, it's, it, that doesn't seem to, by itself at least, uh, justify the idea that they have rights. Now, I mean, it's not like it's a completely irrelevant issue. If, if for example, uh, you, uh, you're pregnant and you want to have a child, sure. And there's different medical procedures that might be involved in, in having that. Uh, you, you don't want to cause unnecessary pain. There's good evidence that uh, when, sh when, the, when the fetus is subjected to noxious stimuli in utero, that it can have adverse health effects on it uh, later on in life. Uh, and you know, if it turned out even that you didn't want to keep the child, say you wanted it originally, but it turns out there's some birth defect and uh, you need to abort it. You, there's no reason to cause it pain if it, if it could feel pain. And so, yeah. but the, the, the end of the story is not, nothing here helps establish that the child has rights or even that there shouldn't be an abortion for the reason I already mentioned about how animals don't have rights either. 
but also, I mean, there's such a thing as uh, as uh, fetal analg analgesia. You can you can actually uh, you can numb the pain that the fetus feels. Uh, and so, I mean, at most, what any discovery of fetal pain would give us would be maybe you should uh, you should give some painkiller to the fetus before the abortion happens. Um, well, but there's but, also isn't there a tradition in in philosophy? Certainly, like P Paul Singer and and others where all of morality is kind of, and this is why Paul Singer is a huge animal rights person, because he, 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 the standard for morality is the absence of pain. And once right. he establishes that standard, give him credit at least, that he's willing to go all the way to animals because he says, as soon as there's pain, and I wonder what his position on abortion is. Well, that's interesting. Probably actually. a lefty, right? So Peter Singer is, he's actually in favor of abortion. So how does he uh, And do in that? fact, he's even in favor of infanticide. Uh, and it's uh, in cases where he thinks it would use too many resources and deprive people of those resources. But and, so he and, measures the pain, the relative pain in a utilitarian sense of yes. And but more important for his position, as I understand it, and I think this is true of most utilitarians, is that uh, they they even most utilitarians don't think that every kind of pleasure and pain matters uh, if there's not a sufficient degree of self consciousness that an organism has of its own pleasure or pain, then they don't think that uh, it, it uh, has any intrinsic value, which of course I think raises all kinds of interesting questions about the, the, the merits of utilitarianism, because if we discover, oh, it's not the pleasure or pain by themselves that have value significance, uh, it starts, you start to see that they have to build more uh, facts about consciousness and reason in to understand the value. And that I think pushes you out of utilitarianism. Yep. There are a few, I think, utilitarians who are against late-term abortion uh, for that reason, but not too many. And uh, one of the things that I think is really interesting about this controversy, uh, and it connects then also to the DNA question, is that it, and one of the reasons I'm interested in this whole controversy is because I think the whole abortion question is a really excellent example for understanding what is distinctive about the objectivist view of rights. Because it's, it's really on this kind of topic where you see a really clear cut distinction between what objectivists think rights are for and what other people think they're for. So your typical religious conservative is somebody who thinks that rights are these intrinsic attributes that are sort of magically assigned by God. And that's the reason they think we should respect people's rights. And so if that's what you think they are, then uh, there's, there's nothing improbable at all about saying, well, maybe maybe the fetus has rights, maybe the infant has rights, or maybe the, rather the, the embryo has rights. Heck, maybe the sperm cell has rights. And it, 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 it again comes down to, you know, which revelation are you consulting to find out when you think God assigned these magical attributes? Yeah. But for objectivism, rights are not, magical attributes that it rejects the idea that there are these God-given natural rights. Rights are not any kind of attribute at all. They are, uh, the concept of rights is a moral principle that we use to understand what's necessary for coexistence of rational beings in a society. Uh, and so there's a whole context uh, that the concept presupposes, both a philosophical con context and, and a social context. And uh, we need rights in objectivism's view for very specific reasons. We, yep. we, we, I, I, liked, I like here to reference uh, Ankar Gatte's talk from a couple of summers ago where he, uh, in Pittsburgh um, on productiveness, interestingly. And there's a little clip from that talk, which is up on YouTube, where objectivism is about love for productive ability. And he uses this point to illustrate, for example, what's weird about the libertarian view of rights, that libertarians say, you've got a right to do anything that doesn't hurt anybody else. And your rights begin where my fist ends. And he says, this yeah. is yeah. image of people running around with their fists. <laughs> and what's so special about that? And exactly, it's uh, rights are not about protecting people uh, and their fists. They're, they're about protecting uh, the ability of rational, productive adults in a society who need the freedom of the mind to create the, the great benefits of civilization. And so that doesn't mean that only uh, adult 
yep. productive people have rights, but they're the paradigm case of who has rights. And then any other beings who get rights get it kind of by extension, by courtesy from that fact. What is necessary? What kind of uh, rights do we need to assign? Do we need to understand people as having, you know, for this ultimate kind of person to be protected, uh, given especially that people grow up over the course of many years. And so, yes, children have rights too. But especially when you, when you, when something like an embryo or a fetus comes into conflict with the rights of that grown up adult woman, you know, who's, she's the one who's the paradigm case here uh, of the bearer of rights. And so rights are all about resolving conflict with people. They can't be the kinds of things that, that, that bring you into conflict. Yep. And so that's why there, there's just no basis for saying that uh, an infant, uh, sorry, the, an embryo or a fetus uh, can have rights, especially when it comes into conflict with, with the woman, her rights come first. And this is, I think, part of the reason why uh, this was a really important issue for Ayn Rand. This is yep. something she got, you know, very angry about, you know, she, she decided her whole, uh, you know, decisions about who to vote for based on who was assaulting abortion rights. And I think it was because she could see that somebody who alleges that they believe in freedom and, and individual rights, who wants to sacrifice actual adult rational beings to protoplasm is not somebody who believes in rights. And, and uh, it, they have a completely different worldview from her. And, and there's, there's, there's nothing in common there. And she was fighting this idea of natural rights. She was fighting this idea of a mystical uh, source of rights. And, yes. and it's no accident that the people who believe in this mystical source of rights are the same people who are anti-abortion. Uh, and they're the conservatives and they're, they're on the right. And they're, they, you know, they don't understand rights. And that's, that's one of the things among, combined with their altruism and the two are connected which makes them such enemies of freedom and such enemies of liberty ultimately. And they can't, they can't stand up to the left because ultimately they agree with the left. Um.